right, good evening everyone, and happy Sabbath. I mean, we're coming to a close um, of, of the Sabbath day, but by God's grace, we just, want, we, we just want to thank Him for allowing us to get through the day today. And as always, we'll open up in prayer. And I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. I'm just going to ask if if uh, one of our, our members that's here in the Zoom, if y'all could open us up in prayer, I'm going to ask Brother John John, you mind opening us up in prayer? Father, we want to say thank you so very much for another wonderful, beautiful, blessed Sabbath day that is coming to a close, oh Lord. But be with us in this Bible study. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Help us to hearken unto you, oh Lord. Give us guidance through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So as you, uh, as you guys can see, uh, the topic today, wise or foolish. This is a very well-known parable within the Bible, but it's prominent today because we're literally in that time. We're getting towards, you know, towards the end. And we have to, we got to wake up, man. Like, the Lord has been showing showing some things and it's pertaining to people that's actually here in this group that's here in the Zoom. So um, I'm, we're going to have a little heart-to-heart -heart later, and I'm just going to talk with you guys because there's some people that are not here. But I'm going to talk with you guys and just, just want you guys to be real because the Lord is planning to do something in the future, and we have to be real with ourselves. It's literally the... the the years are turning into days, the days are turning into hours, and the hours are turning into minutes, okay? And the, the signs of the times are telling us what's, what's coming, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Hello to everybody that's on YouTube. I'm going to address something um, pertaining to the people that are in the comments also, okay? So let's, without further ado, let's begin and let's get into our study, but before we get into our study, I need to address something. So there's an article by uh, Psych Central. It talks about reasons you don't listen. And the reason why we're going to talk about this before we get into the meat of the study is today every a lot of people have a listening problem, okay, or an attention problem. And if you happen to be or have any of these issues regarding as to why you think you might not be able to pay attention at certain times, just be honest with yourself, okay? Because I'm on here. I, I'm, I'm one of the people with supreme ADD, <laughs> right? Reasons you don't listen. Now, here are some of the listed reasons. You have, you have the urge to tell your story. So that's a form of selfishness. Even though somebody may be speaking about something, you you want to be able to get your side of the story out. Okay? If that's you, if that's you, be honest. Okay? How about you want to give advice? I mean, it doesn't sound too bad. But again, we're talking about people who have a listening problem. Or you just want everything to be okay. Maybe it's a situation between you and some a significant other, a friend, or maybe even a stranger. And you want things to settle down. So by by in in by just wanting everything to be okay, you kind of try to close the situ the situation out real real quickly because you just want it to be done with. You react emotionally. How many of how many people are here who do the same thing? Okay. Remember the flesh, man. The flesh. We need to get to the point where the spirit is reacting before the flesh. And a lot of us, a lot of the times, the flesh rises up first before the, the spirit can even communicate with us. That's why the Bible tells us to be quick to listen, you know, slow to speak and quick to listen. It's very important. You're bored. 
<laughs> you're bored. Maybe whatever the person is speaking about, you have no interest in. So you don't even care to listen, no matter how much. How many people have been in a situation where they're talking to someone and you literally don't hear anything they're saying? You just you daydream. Or you're, you're looking at them, but you're not hearing them. I've been there. <laughs> All right? Or you're distracted. I think that's everyone here. How about this? How about you think you know what people are thinking? How about that? I think that's a lot of people in here. We have the ability, we, we think we have the ability of God to read a person's heart or their mind. Okay, and that's the dangerous thing. You know, especially if you get in an argument with somebody, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. At least the enemy have, have his way with you. So whatever the situation is, deal with it right then and there. Okay, or you rather socialize with others. Maybe that person is not a part of your group. So why am I bringing this to everybody's attention? Because the Lord has been convicting me about something um, pertaining to people who speak in the in the chats. Okay, and it's not everybody, but I want I want people to pay attention to this. There's many times when studies are being given <clears throat> and there's full-fledged conversations going on that have nothing to do with the study at all. And I know many people are guilty of this. So the Lord has brought it to my attention to address it to everyone, whether it be in this study or whether it be in uh, another person's study, we're all guilty of doing it, Okay myself included, but as we're getting towards the end, God is using his vessels, okay, his people, because God uses the word to speak to people, but he also uses other people who are speaking the word. And many of the times while a message is being given in the chats, in the rooms, everybody is having a conversation about things that are not even related to the topic or discussion that's being presented. And I want to encourage everyone to just stop. If what you're talking about doesn't have anything to do with the presentation, just don't talk about it. Because you can miss vital messages from God that he's probably trying to communicate to you. Jesus says in, in John 8, 43. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? The, the, the best example of this is through the scriptures in which Christ is constantly telling his disciples what's going to happen. Listen, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. On this day, the Son of Man is going to be delivered up. But they could not. They weren't listening. They had a listening problem. Okay, they had a listening problem. Christ specifically told them what was going to happen. But they had a listening problem. Did Christ not tell us was how the world is going to end, how it's going to happen? Did he not give us you know, scriptures, did he not give us prophecy as to tell us what's coming? He gave, he made it plain and clear, but yet there's a lot of people who do not understand his speech. And you want to know how I know a lot of people don't understand his speech? It's because you show it in your actions. If you understood the times that we were in, you would be taking your walk a lot more seriously than a lot of us is right now. Myself included. I'm guilty of this myself. But the Lord is waking me up. And this is the message I have for everybody. Wake up. There's literally no time left. You sh every day should be lived as it's your last. Every day.
Every day should be lived as if Jesus Christ was literally in your presence right now. You wouldn't dare do half of the things that you're doing right now because Christ is there. Proverbs says, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. See, we're speaking about the foolish and, and we're speaking about the wise. The wise listen to the words of God. And the words change them. They didn't just hear it and it went through one ear and it went out the other. The words changed them. They conformed. They, they, they were molded into the image of Christ. Doctrines does not save. I don't care how much you know in the Bible. It will not save you. The foolish and the wise, they knew Bible truth. But unfortunately, five were lost. They were lost. Solomon, the man of wisdom, again, once again says, A fool have no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Every single day, we should be looking for things that are within our characters. Ask God to search the heart, to try you. To see if there's what? Any wicked thing that's inside you. To remove it. Because the only thing we can take to heaven is our characters. Nothing else. The body's destroyed. This world is going to be destroyed. The only thing you can take with you into the kingdom is your character. And before, before the coming of Christ... Okay, before you're changed in a twinkling of an eye. There's a certain way that we should be before he comes in the cloud. In the book, Christ Object Lessons, page 406.2, it says, As Christ sat upon, sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, he told the disciples the story of the ten virgins. What does it say? It says, by their experience, illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. So what Christ is, what we're told is that the whole body will be asleep. The five foolish was asleep. The five wise was asleep. But five of them slept in peace. Five of them slept in comfort, comfort of the Lord, in trust in the Lord. The others, they were lying to themselves. What's going on right now? What's going, what is the time? What, are, what is the time that we're in right now? One of the pioneers to the, the Seventh-day Adventist church named Uriah Smith. Speaking on a parable of the, 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 the ten virgins, he goes on to say, No one can pronounce ready till his case has been exam examined to see whether or not he is ready. So nobody right now can sit here confidently and say, I'm good to go. Oh, how soon it happened? Yeah, I'm good. I'm ready. Nobody. Daniel, when speaking, always associated himself with the sinners. Bible says our righteousness are as filthy rags. Nobody should have confidence to, to the point in themselves that they're there. Your confidence should only be in Jesus Christ. It goes on to read, after the bridegroom has come to the marriage, the king must come in to see the guests, to see whether all have on their wedding garments or not. What are you wearing? 
What is this period of examination? It is the period of the investigative judgment in the sanctuary above. We just we just went on little light and we spoke about the sanctuary. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who do not believe in this message. They just don't. And it's Satan's objective to blind people from seeing that God Christ is doing an investigative work. And throughout the scriptures, you clearly see that this is consistent. God does not destroy without investigating first. In Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says that Christ said, let us come down and see what they're doing. What were the people in Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says, let us come down. That's an investigation. Let's see what they're doing. It is a period of, of investigative judgment in the sanctuary above already referred to. Will any of the guests go into the marriage before the very last guest is decided to be ready? No. Why? By no means. And when will that be? When the ministration in the most holy place of the sanctuary is finished and every case is decided. So it's, it's one person not going before the other. We go as a group. So when does the marriage take place? Or in other words, when does Christ receive his kingdom? When he has finished his work as a priest in the heavenly sanctuary. For those of you who are new on the stream and kind of confused, go watch the Little Light videos. We broke down the sanctuary. Everything that took place in the past regarding the sanctuary is repeating itself right now in heaven. Christ did not stop. He did not stop at the cross. It was significant. Yes, we understand, but he did not stop at the cross. And those who have the veils over their eyes and do not push themselves to have an understanding of the sanctuary will be blinded during this investigative journey. You're going to be blindsided and you won't have nobody else to blame but yourself. It boggles me how we can sit there and preach straight scripture, yet people still don't see it. And it's because the God of this world keeps blinding them. We know what took place in 1843, right? And if you don't, go through the videos, okay? Go through the videos. I'm not going to, I will just sum it up. Daniel 8, 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then the, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What sanctuary was Christ talking about in Daniel 8, 14? For, my Bible, the, for the Bible students that hear, y'all know this, okay? But we have to continue to go over these things because you just never know who comes in here, who the Lord will lead in, into here. Remember, we're still talking about the ten virgins, and I'll get to that in a second. So he said, on to me, on to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What sanctuary is this? This is the longest prophecy in the Bible. This is the 2,300-day prophecy in the book of Daniel. History and the Bible are interchangeable. They're, 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 I say interchangeable. They're one and the same. That 2,300 days, the start of judgment, 1844, I showed you 1843, but we know that calculation shows that um, there was no zero. So we got 1844, that's the date that was the start of the judgment, the investigated judgment. So from 1844 to present day, there's a judgment going on. It's the judgment of the dead. But we have an event that's coming in the future. And that is the, that is the Sunday law.
People are currently worshipping on Sunday. Are worshipping on the day of the papacy that they made. Daniel 7.25 said they would think to change times and law. The papacy would think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25. How did they do that? They changed the Sabbath. They changed our calendar so you could not figure out prophecy. They hired Jesuits to go undercover and push an agenda. If you haven't seen the Great Controversy series, we spoke about the Jesuits, how they presented the, the, the seven weeks and they pushed it into the future. Or the 70 weeks, they pushed it into the future so people could not identify the Antichrist as being the papacy. Now, everybody who believe in false doctrine, they're believing that it's a single person. The Antichrist is a single person. They take the, the scriptures of the Daniel prophecy regarding the 2300 days or the 70 weeks, which was talking about the Messiah, and they identify that as the Antichrist and push it into the future. I shared, I shared an, um, an article with the study group. Okay, I'll just pull that up. Brothers and sisters, if you do not understand what's coming, you will know within a few days. If you do not understand what's coming and how quick this is coming, you will be blindsided. This article says that the Supreme Court, which are run by, again, we spoke about this in a great controversy series, which we're going to continue next week. The Supreme Court has about six to seven Roman Catholic judges sitting in the Supreme Court, and they're already pushing to end separation of church and state. What does that mean? They want the church to control the government. When this happens, they will enforce Sunday worship by law. This is all Bible. This is Revelation 13, the United States, which is the second beast, merging with the first beast, which is the papacy. The last time this happened was persecution like you've never seen before. But now in the future, it's going to be double the trouble. Okay, it's going to be double the trouble. I just want to make sure is everybody okay? It's going to be double the trouble, okay, in the future. Because you're going to have the Sunday keeping churches, the apostate Protestantism. And the Roman Catholic Church merging together to persecute the people who are keeping the true day of God. This, this, this is August 10th. This was recent. They're talking about getting rid of church and state. This was prophesied. We're told this was going to happen. And it's coming sooner than anybody can, ex can expect. Are you still sleeping? Many of us are still sleeping. You want to know why? It's like when COVID happened, COVID went away, right? And everybody's thinking things are going to get back to normal. No, no. We're talking about labor pains. This stuff is going to increase all the way to the end. All the way to the end. The 1260 years was the day... It was the dark ages. It was persecution like you've never seen before. This is coming back. The Bible says men's hearts are failing them for fear looking upon the things that's coming on the earth. People are going to be scared. And you don't have, you don't, there's no reason to be scared because if you know prophecy, you know that the Bible says that these things are going to happen. But because people don't listen... And people don't pay attention and they allow the enemy to distract them. They fall victim to the time when it approaches. In Leviticus chapter 23 verse 16. 
speaking about the Day of Atonement, which we're in right now, if you understand the sanctuary, you would understand the feast days. You would understand that one of the feast days was the Day of Atonement. It was one of the last feast days at the end of the year. What were the people supposed to do? The Bible tells you, Leviticus 23, 16, also on the 10th day of the 7th month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls. What are we supposed to be doing right now? Investigating ourselves. It's not only Jesus investigating us. We should be investigating ourselves to see our faults and what needs to be changed because there is no more time left. Give it all up because J Jesus gave everything for us at the cross. You don't want to fall into the category of verse 29 in Leviticus 23, where it says, For whatsoever soul it be, soul, a person, it be, that shall not afflict in that same day, in the antitypical day right now. If you are not afflicting your soul right now, the Bible says he shall be cut off from among his people. What does that word afflict mean? When we look up the stronger coordinates, it means to abase yourself or to humble yourself. It means to humble yourself, to abase yourself. God wants us to be humble. When a humble person listens, when Christ is speaking to them, they're listening, their ears are wide open. Well, someone who's prideful, they're not listening. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, Humble yourself, therefore, in, in humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, afflict yourselves. Afflict yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Where does Christ want to exalt us? Revelation, 30, um, Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh. We are fighting a battle right now. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne? Where does God, where does Christ, where does the Father want to exalt us? To a point where we can sit in the throne with the Father or with the Son. But you have to be humble and willing to listen. If not, brothers and sisters, the Bible makes it clear. There'll be gnashing from the teeth. I don't know what's worse. You tell me what's worse. You purposely not listening to the truth and making a conscious decision to reject light or you knowing all the truth and you don't live it in your life. Christ says it's better that you didn't know him than to know him and don't do his will. There's no such as, as lukewarmness in Christ's kingdom. You either all or you nothing. There's no middle ground. You do a disservice to God's kingdom when you're living a double life. Let's look at this parable about the ten virgins. It goes on to read, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were, were wise, and the five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. 
While the bridegrooms tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. We're going to visit that. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So something significant is happening here. A call is being made. Oh, man. Christ. Christ is coming. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil. For our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, not, not so. Least there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You see, again, many people know this story. But is it hitting? Is it sticking? Is it sticking? Is this story sticking? Does it have significance in your life? This story should be relevant today. Are your vessels filled with oil? Or are you leaning on somebody else for, for understanding? Many people come into these studies just to watch it. And this is the bread. This is all the bread that they have for the week. Too many people are dependent on these studies. Make sure that you're doing your work and you're studying and you're learning about Christ on your own. Do not wait into a study or somebody goes live. There's emails that's being sent to brothers, brothers that are within our group. Within the School for Prophets group. Talking about why this person didn't go live. You, you don't have a Bible for yourself? Is... is are, are we supposed to be the only person that's supposed to teach you? The Bible says study to show yourself approved. Your own self. Open your own Bible. Read your Bible. If one of us does not go live, go live, it's for a reason. And with that said, you should have your personal time with God right then and there. You know, the clock is ticking right now. The clock is ticking right now. Matthew 25, 6. Let's go back to that verse. It said, at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. Was it late? Was it too late? Was it too late? That's what I'm asking. Every was it too late? When the cry was made, was it too late? Looking at the story revolved around Exodus. Pharaoh would eventually lose his firstborn. Exodus 12, 29 says, and it came to pass that at what time? What time? Was it too late? What time does Jesus come? At midnight, the darkest hour. What time did Christ come in the days of Moses to smite the firstborn of Pharaoh? Midnight. 
who did it? The Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Was it too late? Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments. Everybody should be looking down at themselves, examining themselves, make sure. Let me see. Do I have... Is my shirt, is my garment speckled? I have a taint of sin. This is something that I need to work on. Lord, give me the strength. I can't do it by myself. This scripture is significant because it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Do you know that can happen any second? That can happen right now. Christ can come as a thief tomorrow. You're not guaranteed to wake up tomorrow. What if you die in your sleep? Christ came as a thief. Pen and Inspiration says in the Desire Ages, my favorite book of all time. All who confess Christ must have Christ abiding in them. They cannot communicate that which they have not received. In other words, you cannot teach something to somebody that Christ ain't teach you. And the only way to learn is by reading the word of God. The disciples might speak fluently on doctrines. Doctrines don't save. They might repeat the words of Christ. So what? You know a couple of scriptures. But unless the possessed Christ-like meekness and love, they were not confessing him. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. A spirit contrary to the spirit of Christ would deny him whatever the, the profession. There's so many people who know so much. That, that does not matter. Doctrine will not save you. People may deny Christ by evil speaking, by foolish talking, by words that are un truthful or unkind think about that the next time you open your mouth they may deny him by shunning life's burden god gives you a job to do you don't want to do it because it's too hard you deny christ they may deny him by conforming to the world that's obvious by uncautious behavior, by the love of their own opinions. Mercy. Do you know you can make your own opinions an idol? How about this? By justifying self. This is probably everybody here. By cherishing doubt, you deny Christ. Oh, I don't think Christ is capable of, of changing me. I, this is so difficult. This walk is so hard. He who began a good work is going to finish it onto the day of Jesus Christ. In all these ways, they declare Christ is not in them. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Think about this. There's too many people in the world who have a form of godliness, not even just the world. There's people who are in the church who have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power of. So what was the contrast? What was the contrast between these two classes? Because these are two classes that are going to be here to the very end. Christ said, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. Ten virgins. Let's look at the, the let's compare and contrast. The five wise, they waited for the, to meet the bridegroom. So did the foolish. 
Five wise had had lamps. Foolish had lamps. So they, they pretty much they look in the light. But here's where we take a shift. The five wise they took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The foolish, they had no oil in their vessels. Or if they did have oil, they eventually ran out. The five wise they fell asleep waiting on a bridegroom. So did the foolish. See, you can sleep. You can go to sleep. Just make sure you're sleeping in Christ. The five wise, they trimmed their lamps. So did the foolish. But what happened? Okay. What about the five wise? What happened when the bridegroom called? They were prepared and were full of the Holy Spirit and were ready to meet the bridegroom. But the foolish, not so. They were unprepared. In fact, they missed the bridegroom. What are the virgins? The virgins, they were guests at the marriage feast. It was a symbol of the church, the people in the church who professed to be pure in faith, or they professed to follow Jesus. Or they profess to be redeemed from among men. Or they profess to have no guile. I ain't professing none of this. I'm just praying that I have this in mind. I would never profess this. A humble person would never profess that they don't have any of these things. You would just pray and ask God that, that you do have these things. But I don't know anybody who would be like, oh, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, I'm good at That's not humble. Revelation 14, 4 said, These are they which were not defiled with the woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They followed Christ wherever he went. The shepherd, they followed the shepherd. My sheep, they know what? They know my voice. What about the vessels? What are the vessels that's spoken about in Matthew 25, talking about the, the, the ten virgins? Know ye not that you are the temple of God? You are the vessel. And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. You are the vessel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthly vessels. That the excellency of the, of, of the power may be of God and not of us. We don't do anything. It is God who worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Speak about the oil. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and took. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David. This could be all of us. Then we have the lamp, well-known scripture. Thy word is a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. The word of God. The lamp was in fact the word of God. Can you imagine having the word of God in your hand? Because this is a lot of people that's in the church. A lot of the people who are even in the false churches. They have the word of God, yet it holds no power. Speak about the bride. And there came on to me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride. So what's the bride? Verse, verse 10. And he carried me away and in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. So that question was asked, let me show you the lamb's wife. It's a, it's, it's. It has a dual meaning. It's both the church, but it's also the holy city, Jerusalem. Why? Because we are going to be in the holy city, Jerusalem. So right now, Christ has, he has a kingdom, but his people is not in the kingdom yet. 
All right. Then when we move on to the bridegroom, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Pure. Paul was speaking about purity. No stains, no wrinkles, no sin is how we need to be presented to Christ. And then lastly, we spoke, it speaks about the marriage or the marriage supper. Matthew 8, 11 says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Luke twenty two thirty 30 says that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. His table. So what's lacking? What is the, the, what is the necessity that we need right now and how can we obtain it? In the book, Christ Object Lessons, it says without the spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. Hmm. Hmm. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. I said it before and I'll say it again. Doctrines do not save you. Jesus does. Your relationship with Christ does. It says the theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. Examine yourself. All these the theologians who get all mathematical with the Bible, there's no need. You can a person with the Holy Spirit can do more justice with the Word of God than somebody who just knows the Word who's lacking the Spirit. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible. Do you hear this? Are you guys hearing this? You could be familiar with the commands and the promises of the Bible, but it holds no effect unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home. The character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. Christ is the only one who can keep us up from the keep us away from the hour of temptation. He's the only person who can do this. But if you don't allow him to enter your heart, Allow the Holy Spirit and Christ to work together to transform you. When the deceptions come, which are present today, this is why a lot of people cannot see this truth regarding the sanctuary, regarding the Sabbath. He's attacking the pillars of our faith. If he can attack these things and keep people in darkness, they're easy prey. When the time comes, when the storm comes, they're going to be swept away just like the people in the days of Noah. We should be praying as the psalmist did in, our, in, in Psalms 51, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This is significant. This is a prayer that we should be praying to, 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 to God in Jesus' name. Lord, do not, please don't remove my spirit. Don't, re don't remove your spirit from me. We've seen what happened in Genesis 6 when God said that my spirit shall not always strive with men because the thoughts of men are evil continually. I want you to understand this. What led to the flood? The Bible says the thoughts of men were evil continually. They weren't necessarily doing evil. They were just thinking it. They were just 
thinking it. God said the thoughts of men were evil continually. They weren't necessarily acting it out. They were just thinking it. And that shows you how powerful the mind is. And just thinking it is just as bad as acting it out. In God's eyes, you're doing it. So I want you, I want you to see a parallel, okay? So this, here's the situation. You got people running to, they're late to a cruise ship. Let's just look at this. It's just like with airplanes. The second it leaves the gate, it is not coming back for you. These two different sets of passengers on two different cruises in Nassau Bahamas don't seem to know that and start running and shouting after the ships. Shouting. Do you think that we will have the ability to tell Jesus to stop? Stop your time. Don't come yet, Jesus. I'm not ready. It doesn't work like that. Jesus is the lifeboat. When he set sail, if you're not ready, you're going to drown. The Bible says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And the pen of inspiration says, when the irrevocable decision of the sanctuary has been pronounced, when the sanctuary is cleansed, when the, heavy, when the heavenly sanctuary is cleansed, that's it. He that's unjust is going to be unjust still. He that is righteous is going to be righteous still. You're stuck that way. When the irrevocable decision of the sanctuary has been pronounced in the heavens of the above, when Michael stands up, that's it. It says, and the destiny of the world has been fixed. Forever fixed, the inhabitants of the earth will know it not. The forms of religion will be continued by a people from whom the Spirit of God has been finally withdrawn. If you do not have the Holy Spirit and that's removed from you, just like in the days of Noah, there's only one spirit left and that is a sat satanic spirit. All you're going to know how to do is wrong. The forms of religion will be continued by a people from whom the spirit of God has been finally withdrawn. And the satanic zeal with which the prince of evil will inspire them for accomplishments of his, his designs and will bear symptoms of the zeal for God. So they will have a zeal, but their zeal will be for the enemy. When God removes his spirit, people don't even understand. Like, yeah, don't like people don't get it. It's only by the grace of God that this world, <laughs> that this world is not in chaos. How much more time can Jesus give us? Give us? How, how much more time? He can't. Jesus, he he. Everything is on a set schedule. Jesus. He came, he died on the cross on a set schedule. That means he has a set schedule for when the clock is going to stop. Matthew 25 verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. When the door was shut by the ark, were the people able to get in? Were they able to open it? Speaking about the days of Noah. The Bible says when the, 
when the doors were shut, it was due prior to this. Dew gave moisture to all the land. There was no rain until the, the door shut. First time ever these people see rain. And what is rain symbolic of? The Holy Spirit. And here we have rain falling all around them, yet they're still not either, they're not able to discern the time that they're in. Genesis 7 verse 4 says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Seven days. When Christ cleanses that sanctuary and probation closes, people are going to be going about their lives for seven days, not even knowing that they're lost. Not even knowing that they are lost. Why? Because their concern was elsewhere. They got distracted. They didn't want to listen. We kept warning them. Christ keeps warning us. Matthew 24, 38 says, For as in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah, Noah entered into the ark. This is what they were doing. They occupied them th themselves with things that were was irrelevant to their salvation. One of the books that was written by Moses was the book of Job. Guess what they were doing in the book of Job? The same thing. Job 1.13 says, And there was a day when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And what happened? And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. So I want to have a heart to heart with specific people that's in this group right now. With the people that's in this Zoom meeting right now. I'm going to ask everybody just bow your heads real quick. And we're just going to pray. And then I'm going to speak to, I'm going to speak to some people in here. It doesn't matter that people are on YouTube, that they're, they're watching. It's, it's all right. Let's pray. Uh, dear, kind, dear kind and righteous Father, Lord, you know, we just want to thank you for um, this close of Sabbath, Lord, and just allowing this day to be a blessing. Lord, I pray that. You use me as a vessel and allow the words to come out of my mouth, not to be mine, but yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So there are people here in this group. So if y'all don't know this by now, God had set up the meet for me, Brother Tilla, Brother Darius, all of us to meet together. It was all God. He set up for us to go Tennessee, drive all over, meet all these people, Little Life Studios, um, Pastor Ivan Meyer, Dr. O. God set all that up because he's something big is coming. He needs to warn his people. This is why this whole second coming documentary is in the process. But something was supposed to happen when we met. God was supposed to do something, but he couldn't do it. And you want to know why he couldn't do it? Because he said we weren't ready. And the we was not pertaining 
to just me, Brother Darius, and Tilla. The we was pertaining to people that's in this group here that God is going to eventually put together. So there are people in this group right now who will be with us together. Okay? God is going to set up a way for all of us to come together and to work together when this time comes to preach the gospel. But he says that many of us that are here, myself included, are not ready. So what does that mean? I don't know specifically who he's talking about, so I have to address everybody. Examine your heart. Examine yourself. You know who you are. You know the Lord is going to set this stuff up. He's going to set it up. But he said he can't wait any longer. Because he has a set time. So if you're not taking this walk serious. And redeeming the time that we have left here. The door is going to shut on you. The door is going to shut on you. And you're going to be found wanting. You're going to be your teeth not gnashing. You're going to be wailing and gnashing at the teeth. Don't, don't come to the, the wedding feast late. Because Christ is going to close that door on you. And he's going to say, I never knew you. No matter how much you knew up to, the, up to that point, he's going to say, I never knew you. And this goes to every single person that's in, in here that's watching right now. When I tell you guys that there's literally no more time left. I don't know how many times I get on here. I keep saying it over and over and over again. There's no more time left. So if you know. That you're supposed to be one of the people that are going to be grouped up with us because there are many people that's in here. I know. I already know. I haven't said anything, but this is the message for you guys right now. The Lord is going to put us all together to work together for the time that's coming. But if you keep playing games, you're going to get left behind. I want you to examine this. Examine the image. Let it dwell in your mind. Let it dwell in your mind. He did everything he could possibly do to save us. There is no um, amount of sacrifice that we need to give up. Because the sacrifice he made outshines anything that we would give up. Christ is so merciful. God is so merciful that he's giving, he's warning us with his word. Listen, when the four angels are released, that's it. That's close of probation. When those winds part, that's close of probation. That's it. There's no, there's no going back. There's no second chances. That's it. I'm going to close here. Pen Inspiration says this. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth. 
and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He's our high priest in heaven. Read Hebrews. He gazed in pity on the remnant, the people that were left. Jesus is, is up there in the heavens and he's looking down at us. And he's like, I died for these people. Then he raises his hands and with a voice of deep pity, he cried, my blood, father, my blood, my blood. The father's like, I, listen, we got we to gotta set schedule. We got to be on time. We do everything in sevens, the number of perfection. The earth is 6,000 years old. At 7,000, 7, we need to start this millennium. And Christ says, but dad, my blood, my blood, dad, I died for them. It says, then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the throne, the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. And I saw an angel fly with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do in the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, hold. Hold, hold until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Even before the close of probation, Christ is using every bit of opportunity to seal each and every one of us. But what are we doing with the time? What are we doing with the time that Christ is giving us? Redeem, redeem the time because the days are evil. That's all I'm going to say. Let us close in prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, Lord, as always, we must give you thanks and praise. Lord, you, you, you're the one who presented this message. Help this not to go in one ear and out the other, but for us to consume it the same way we would consume your words. Allow this to reach the hearts of many, the new people, the, the people who are reoccurring here. Lord, open their, their hearts and open their minds to understand that we are living in the last days and you are soon coming. But before you come, there's a huge test that we have to pass. And the only way we can pass it is with your help. So, Lord, as we cling onto your hand, as you sit upon that throne, Lord, do not let us go. We pray. We are asking for forgiveness of our sins, Lord. Help us to fight this battle, Lord. Help us to win this race. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going we're gonna to close here. Um, by God's grace, we'll see if we can continue with the youth studies next Thursday. I know it's been two weeks, but obviously we were in um, we were in Tennessee, in Alabama, uh, but we're trying to get back on schedule. A lot of editing to do, um, but God willing, He's going to get us through. As I, you keep me in prayers. I'll, I'll keep everybody in prayer. This specific group, there's a group of people here. I'm telling you guys. God is saying, like, you have to take your, take, I, I would say everybody that's in this Zoom chat right now, take your walk serious. 
take your walk serious. Starting now on, take it serious. Like, don't just go back into those same ways. Take your walk serious. Good night, everybody. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word